he just didn't have time to put out before so it's pretty exciting to dig through a lot of this stuff it was here they spotted something really unusual in their case where they keep a lot of their expensive games check this out this is ncaa football 14 and it costs 150 dollars now i understand this game is a bit of a special case because it's the last ncaa game to come out and it's been getting really popular to watch on twitch and i guess fans have continued to keep the roster updated plus i guess the previous year is also collectible and so are some of the tiger wood games it's funny because i assumed that all sports games were one to five dollars max and here's one that is just wow crazy expensive but speaking of games that are not expensive i was excited to see a game i've been looking for for a while and i'm not sure why i wasn't able to find it till now and that is Time Shift on the PlayStation 3. It also came out on the 360. This is another game that has been recommended to me for years now. And yeah, to get it for $5.50, uh, I can do that. It was also cool to see a bunch of vinyl records being highlighted in their store. Most of them are video game related, but also there are some that are based on anime as well as movies. And I'm really tempted to get that N64 sign for the game room. That thing is awesome. However, one thing is kind of a bummer about this location. See, half of this building is retail, which you see here, and the other half is an awesome barcade. Basically, it's a full arcade with a full bar, and sadly, bars are not allowed to be open just yet, but hopefully soon. All right, I got some loot. Let's go home, and I'll show you what I got. The first one here is Risk of Rain 2 on the PlayStation 4. Now, actually, Will bought this because he wants to play this with me. I have not played the sequel, but I've heard really good things about it. I guess it's a third-person roguelike shooter. It's got some co-op to it, I guess. I have no idea. I haven't played it yet. So if you have and you like it, you got some suggestions for me, yeah, post it down below. I picked up this game called Monkey King Hero is Back on the PlayStation 4. This was a total blind buy at Pinkerella. It was like $10. And I thought, okay, this looks kind of interesting. It looks like it's got decent graphics. I guess it's based on an animated movie that came out a while ago. It's a beat em up, it's a platformer. I guess it's very old school feeling. So I'm kind of curious to check it out. It looks like it's got decent graphics at least. And here's another game I picked up, again, cheap at Pinkerella, simply because it looked interesting and I'd never seen it before. Arsland, the Warriors of Legend. I guess this is based on an anime, but it's a, I guess it's part of the Dynasty Warriors series, maybe, or maybe it uses that engine. I'm not entirely sure. So again, haven't played it yet. If you played it uh, and you dig it, or you got some pointers for me when I start playing it, let me know down in the comments below. However, here's a game I did play, at least on the Vita, and I absolutely loved it. That, of course, is The Wolf Among Us on the Xbox One. I believe I paid $5 for this, and it is such a good series of adventure games. Oh, man, the story is so good. The, the characters are so interesting. Uh, if you haven't played The Wolf Among Us, I highly recommend it. And then here's two Xbox 360 games that I've heard of, but... For whatever reason, I didn't have in my collection. I've never played them before. Um, that, of course, is the Army of Two and uh, Kane and Lynch Dead Men. Now, both of these are third-person shooters, and they're really set up to be co-op shooters. And so I wanted to get these because I want to play these with Will. Uh, I thought that'd be pretty fun. Uh, I'm not sure which one to start with, though. So if you have a preference, let me know down in the comments. And then I mentioned Time Shift. This, of course, is the PlayStation 3 version. Uh, this game has been recommended to me for years now because it's a first-person shooter, but you have this time manipulation ability that's supposed to be really fun. Now, at the time, this game didn't review very well, and I'm not expecting, you know, the best shooter of all time, but I do think it's pretty interesting, um, you know, for $5. You know, if I play it for five hours, I've got my money's worth. I also picked up these Pac-Man games for the 360, and the reason why I picked these up, well, it's because Joe from GameSack did a video on these probably a couple months ago, and I'd seen them before, but I didn't know anything about them, and actually, he kind of liked them, so this was one that was like, yeah, you know, for about $5, sure, I'll check them out. And here we have another 360 game called Greg's Hastings Paintball 2. Now, the reason why I picked this up is because I played the original on the Xbox, the original Xbox, and 
that's actually kind of a fun first person shooter. So I saw that there was a sequel. I had no idea. I've never played this before, but again, such a cheap game that even if I get a couple hours out of it and a couple laughs, I'm fine with it. As well as Bionic Commando, again on the 360. So been on a serious 360 kick, just trying to pick up some games that I kind of missed the first time around. And I don't know if this game is any good or not. I watched a trailer for it and Honestly, it kind of reminds me of Spider-Man. Now, obviously I'm familiar with the original arcade version, but this one's full 3D and yeah, it kind of looks like a Spider-Man game. So I don't know. Let me know down in the comments if it's actually good. All right, guys. Well, that is my day out game hunting in Seattle after months of being inside. And it's been glorious as you might expect, but there are probably seven or eight other retro gaming stores that I could hit up so if you like this video, let me know because there are many more stores to explore and lots and lots of games to potentially pick up. All right, guys, thank you very much for watching. Thank you so much for subscribing and take care. The Nintendo Entertainment System is widely credited with resurrecting the North American home video game market and was a defining feature of the standard American childhood in the 1980s. In 1991, the Super Nintendo was released and immediately locked horns with the Sega Genesis for control of the 16-bit generation. A pair of ill-fated systems launched in 1993 foretold the transition of home gaming into 3D, but it was the 1995 release of both the Sega Saturn and Sony PlayStation that brought it into the mainstream. And even with AAA titles like Yoshi's Island and Donkey Kong Country 2 yet to come, it was obvious that the Super Nintendo could no longer remain as Nintendo's flagship product. On this episode of Classic Gaming Quarterly, in 1996, Nintendo joined the 3D revolution by partnering with Silicon Graphics to develop the Nintendo 64. And while many in the older generation of gamers had moved on to the Saturn and PlayStation, in the mid to late 1990s, the N64 made Nintendo fanatics out of a whole new generation of gamers. The history of 3D gaming stretches all the way back to the early 1980s with vector-based arcade games like Battlezone, as well as home computer games including 3D Monster Maze. By the late 80s, 3D graphics had matured to the point that racing games like Namco's Winning Run and Atari's Hard Driving were able to, through the use of polygons, give a rough approximation of the real world. However, polygon-based 3D graphics required powerful hardware, leaving home consoles of the time to fake it with techniques like raster effects. In the 16-bit era, the Super Nintendo's Mode 7 scaling and rotation made pseudo-3D games like Pilot Wings possible. But Nintendo's first foray into proper 3D gaming came with the development of the Super FX chip, a graphical coprocessor that allowed for polygon-based 3D graphics. The chip was most notably used in 1993's Star Fox, a 3D rail shooter that was co-developed by UK-based Argonaut Games, who also developed the chip itself. The Super FX chip opened a Pandora's box, and Nintendo wanted to emphasize 3D graphics moving forward. An enhanced version of the chip called the GSU-2 was used to create Star Fox 2, which was completed in 1995 but never released. By this time, both the Saturn and PlayStation had been released in Japan, and Nintendo wanted to avoid comparisons between Star Fox 2 and games on competitors' more advanced hardware. They also
also wanted to create a stronger association between 3D gaming and their next entry in the home console market. Silicon Graphics created workstation computers that were capable of rapid 3D modeling, which in the early days primarily had applications in the fields of science and engineering. This, an application for this might be an auto assembly plant where you're grabbing a, a metal part to be welded into an, another area. The company was founded in Silicon Valley by a 